Thank you for joining us, Professor Gensko. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thanks so much. Well, firstly, we'd love to know what motivated you to pursue a career in economics and specialize in media economics? I think, you know, I, this goes back to, you know, when I was an undergrad and thinking about different things to do. And I, I think I'd always been interested in social science and trying to understand social problems. And I think what got me excited about economics was realizing that there seemed to be a really powerful set of tools that economics had to try to tackle those problems. You know, I was interested in math and I was interested in data and statistics, and it seemed to be a place where those tools could be applied to really important social problems that I cared about. So I, I think that was, you know, what pulled me toward economics generally. And then finding my way to studying media was really I think like for a lot of people, not a very deliberate, strategic, carefully thought out decision, but just the way it often happens when I was in graduate school, I was exploring different topics, looking for um, research projects, different things to do. And I, I kind of stumbled my way into several different projects that all had something to do with media and um, those worked out well. And as I worked on them, I got more and more excited about that as an area of focus. Wonderful. So we'd love to talk about some of your work pre-receiving the John Bates Clark Medal. So firstly, in your paper on Media Slant, you estimate a model of newspaper demand and find that 20% of the variation in newspaper slant is explained by variation consumers' ideology. So talking about the robustness of this finding, how do you deal with the possibility of reverse causality? For, for instance, causality that runs from the slant to consumer beliefs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. So, so I think, um, as you said, one of the things that we were trying to do in that paper is isolate and measure how much of the variation we see across different news outlets is catering to what their customers want. So conservative outlets are conservative because that's what their viewers or readers want. Um, liberal outlets are more liberal because that's what their readers want. And so certainly, as you say, there's also causality running the other direction, which is those readers might be conservative or liberal because of what they're reading in the newspaper. And in, in, in some sense, that's actually a, a big motivation for why we care about any of this stuff at all. Like we want to understand what drives media slant in part because we think it has big impacts on people. So um, that's a, an important challenge in, in that paper. What we did, which I think goes some way toward addressing that, is just there are a lot of other characteristics that are relatively fixed, predetermined characteristics of people that are very strongly correlated with their ideologies. So you can predict somebody's ideology based on where they live, their age, their education level, things like religiosity. Um, and, you know, while you might think a newspaper makes somebody more conservative. You don't think a newspaper is going to change somebody's age uh, very much. So what we could do is use those predetermined characteristics as, as what are called instrumental variables, like use them to as a shifter of consumers' ideology and basically show that newspapers in places whose consumers have characteristics that predict that they should be conservative those newspapers tend to adopt conservative slant and newspapers in places whose readers have age and income and education and so on that predict they would be liberal, tend to adopt more liberal slant. I see. That's quite creative. So given that different media are designed to appeal to their readers, would this improve or reduce their quality? And is there a trade-off between accuracy and quality? Yeah, that's sort of a deep question um, because it really depends on what is quality and whether we think that consumers in making decisions are going to prefer news outlets with high quality. So I think, you know, the kind of simplest world that economists might like to think about is one where people know what is 
uh, you know, what gives them happiness or utility, they're going to choose that. And the more firms have incentives to try and give people what they want, the better the quality is going to be. So people know what kind of cars they like. And so car companies that fight hard and compete to try to give consumers what they want are going to make better cars. And, you know, ice cream companies that try to find the flavors of ice cream that people like are going to increase quality. There, there are two big reasons why that's a little less clear in the media space. One is that people themselves may not always uh, know what they want in some sense. For example, it may be that 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 people, their true welfare is higher when they have accurate information, but it's very hard for them to tell in the market what information is accurate and not accurate. And they could be, could be that, that uh, they're swayed to like things that are less accurate. The other is that, and maybe even more importantly, you know, this is an example of a setting where the impact of what news somebody chooses is not only on themselves, but also on the broader society, particularly in a democracy where if everybody chooses to get um, less accurate information, that doesn't only impact them, but it also impacts political outcomes. It impacts how well the democracy functions. And so, and so people are going to not tend to take those things into account. So I, I, I think that the real answer is we, we don't still, I think, have a clear answer to how those things balance out. But I, my own view is there's a large extent to which, you know, people are looking for accurate information about the world and competing to try to deliver that to them is going to have benefits. But I think there are also real concerns about um, places where those preferences may not really be aligned with what's best for society. I see. But well, getting a little bit more abstract, would a social planner prefer either a single unbiased news source or, on the other hand, free entry of differentiated media outlets with a full spectrum of consumer ideologies appealed to? And, you know, you would assume that, that the second option would increase the utility of the even individual. So what do you think about that? And in general, how might we reconcile normative implications arising from such trade-offs? Yeah, that's also really interesting. Um, I, I think in some ways it depends on what, how much power you're willing to endow that social planner with. So if, if we, let's maybe start from a premise that one thing we might be looking for is for people to have accurate information and accurate beliefs about the world. Then if the social planner could create one media outlet that always reports everything perfectly accurately and have everybody choose to listen to that media outlet and learn perfectly accurately, then that would be great. And so I think in that simple world, you might be happy with that. I think in reality, there are a long list of reasons why that things aren't so simple and why having all of the power and influence in the hand of a single media outlet is risky. So among the reasons you might be worried are one, maybe that one outlet is not going to always report what is truthful. Um, you might be worried that they, they won't always have perfect information. You might be worried that they'll be influenced by politicians, by corporations, by other powerful interests in society. If there's this one media outlet that shapes everything everybody believes and determines the outcome of every election, there's a lot of pressure to try to manipulate them. And so in reality, there, there's a long list of reasons why we think competition among multiple different competing media outlets can tend to discipline those sorts of risks and may in some cases make it more likely we get to the truth. The other big reason I think is the one you kind of alluded to in your question, which is also, well, maybe that's not what people want. And maybe people like hearing, you know, news, which is kind of cheerleading for their own side and making fun of the other side and telling telling silly things that people on the other side did that that you can kind of laugh at them for. And um, people may get real 
enjoyment for from that and and we might want to count that and i think that's could be another reason i would i would note also even if you didn't want to even if you said you know what i don't really care about that kind of utility of people i'm happy to have them not have that enjoyment so that we can get more accurate information th th there's an additional layer of that which is just most of the time you can't force people to watch the news you can't force people to pay attention to things and so if you create sometimes academics have in mind this like oh it would be so great if we just had this one news outlet that broadcast really you know highbrow political speeches and data analysis and basically what the academics themselves kind of imagine to be great content that would be so wonderful the world for the, for the world but i think what, what would happen then is just like nobody would watch it and so one of the things that this kind of catering to consumers does is it provides media outlets strong incentives to give consumers content that they really find enjoyable, entertaining, interesting, and that gets them watching. And so it may be that the alternative in your world of just one kind of super accurate, unbiased, whatever that means, media outlet is that not that many people would watch it and people could end up less informed as a result. I see. That's really interesting. Now, moving on to another really interesting piece of research that you've done, you pioneer the theory of Bayesian persuasion that looks at an interaction where a sender chooses a signal to send a receiver, who then takes an action that affects the welfare of both players. You find that such a signal indeed exists under such certain conditions. So could you elaborate on what those conditions are and what is the nature of that signal? Sure. So, so first of all, just to clarify, I think that to state the question a little more precisely, the, the question that we're asking there is when is there a signal that makes the sender better off? I.e., when, if I'm a perfectly rational sender and you're a perfectly rational receiver, so I'm trying to persuade you, you know that I'm trying to persuade you, you can in whatever sophisticated way kind of account for the fact that I'm trying to persuade you, can I still nevertheless change your actions, change your beliefs in a way that's going to benefit me? Um, and so what we're talking about is what are the conditions under which that kind of signal exists? I, I as a sender can, despite the fact that the receiver might be totally sophisticated and rational and aware that I'm trying to persuade them, I can nevertheless do it in a way that benefits me. Um, so before talking about the conditions, let me just say why we got interested in that was I think there's an intuition that that may be impossible. And there are some simple kind of benchmark examples um, where, you know, you could, if you think of these signals as a number that I'm going to send, there's some, you know, something that I'm trying to persuade you of, like the quality of my product. And I'm going to just send a number which says, all right, I think the quality, I'm, I'm telling you the quality is seven. Um, Suppose that it the way I tried to persuade you is just instead of reporting the true quality, I tell you the quality plus some number, like plus three. So if, if the real quality is one, I'll tell you four. If the real quality is seven, I'll tell you 10 and so on. That might seem like, wow, I'm biasing what I'm telling you. That's going to tend to make you think the quality is higher than it really is. But that's not really going to work because if you're sophisticated and you understand that that's what I'm doing, you can just adjust for that. Like you can just subtract three from whatever I tell you to get back the true quality, which is what you're trying to learn. So a lot of people had this intuition in different contexts that if the person listening is sophisticated and kind of knows what the sender is trying to do, that they can unwind that in a way that they can't be persuaded. So um, we show that pretty generally, actually, the sender can benefit. And the conditions are a little bit um, technical. We could talk about it more, but I think a way to, a way to think about it is um, what, what rationality implies is I can't change somebody's beliefs on average. So if, if you have some belief about the quality and it, and it has some average, whatever I do, that's going to go up in some cases and go down in some cases. And if the payoff to me as the sender was just linear in those beliefs, that's the case in which there's nothing I can do. But roughly speaking, if it's not linear, and in particular, if it has some regions where it's convex or 
um, discontinuous, then there's room for me to, I can move your belief up some of the time and down some of the time. And I can do that in a way that the benefit to me of moving it up is big. And the, the way I'm moving it down doesn't hurt me so much, roughly speaking. So one example is like, if, if the decision that the receiver is taking is um, discrete, meaning instead of choosing like a continuous action, they're choosing just yes or no, or, you know, one, two, or three discrete decisions like that, we show that generically um, signals that, that benefit the sender exist. I see. That's really interesting. And I found it particularly interesting that there was no, you know, in sender communicating to the receiver, there was no trickery involved. It was just how much information you decided to reveal. So then do you think- Yeah, and I would say, by the way, by the way, just to say on that, you know, I don't, it's really important with that paper, the, the message there is not that senders don't ever actually engage in trickery. You think that in real world persuasion, there is lots of maybe mistakes and biases and psychological forces going on so that um, not all persuasion in the real world is described by this kind of rational model. I think the way to think about what we're trying to do is, is draw a clear line between what is possible even when everybody is sophisticated and rational, and then what are other things that can only arise if that is not the case. Certainly. And building on that, do you think Bayesian persuasion could apply to policy making? For example, in the pandemic where each sender has to con convince multiple receivers, all of whom have a welfare that's dependent on each other's actions? Yeah. So I, I do think at this broad level, these insights apply to lots of real world settings, including the pandemic one. Again, as I said, I, I wouldn't apply them in the kind of naive way of let's assume that everybody in the world is rational and then assume therefore that that the persuasion we see in the real world will be what is predicted by this model. I think it's helpful for the real world in recognizing what are these kind of forces that exist even under rationality. And then we can draw a clean line between that and other stuff, which requires bias. Um, but the, the point that in something like a pandemic, it's not just like one sender and one receiver much of the time. It's like you're, you know, if you're the, the um, CDC, like the agency in the US in charge of public health, and you're broadcasting messages to the whole population, you have to worry about the fact that those messages are going to lots of different people. And as you said, not only are there lots of different people, but each of their actions kind of affects others' actions. So that definitely makes the problem a lot more rich and complicated. It is fine in a sense from the perspective of the theory. So the simple version of that model is just one sender and one receiver. But um, we talk about what happens and other people have extended that model to look at what happens when there are multiple receivers and maybe those, those multiple receivers are not just choosing independent decisions, but kind of playing a game amongst themselves, um, which is how you might model something like the pandemic case. So um, it's, it's definitely adds a lot of layers of complexity, but broadly speaking, the same ideas I think go through. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, that's really interesting. So, Speaking about some of the more recent research you've done, in your paper on digital addiction, you develop an economic model of digital addiction and you estimate it using a randomized experiment. Could you elaborate on the mechanisms that underlie addiction and what explains the differences that you found between the limit treatment group and the bonus treatment group? Sure, yeah, so, so that's a paper, as you say, the goal was to try to define and measure addiction in the case of smartphones and social media. And um, it, your first question, I think is one really important piece of this, which is we were just trying to make precise or at least offer one precise definition of what addiction might mean. I think that the public conversation around smartphone, social media addiction has been pretty loose where that term addiction gets thrown around a lot in context where it's not really clear what we mean. And sometimes I think what we mean by that gets blurs into just saying, you know, you're addicted to something if you really like it a lot and use it a lot. 
you say, oh, look, you know, this, these kids are spending five hours a day on their phones. They must be addicted or, you know, TikTok is showing them videos that they really, really like that are just incredibly funny and therefore they must be addicted. Um, we, we want to be more precise here and, and separate a case where people just really like the videos on TikTok, which might be great from a perspective of social welfare versus a case where people are somehow using TikTok or YouTube or Instagram or whatever they're using more than is good for them. Um, and so they're making choices which are not even um, maximizing their own utility. So in the model in that paper, we, we suggest that one way to define addiction would be the combination of two different things which have been explored in the behavioral economics literature. The first is what we call habit formation, which is what um, is at the heart of a lot of economic models of addiction, which basically says a good might be addictive if consuming more of it today makes you want more of it tomorrow. So if I give somebody like a lot of heroin today, they are going to then want more heroin, demand more heroin tomorrow than they would have otherwise. Um, you know, on the flip side, if I send them to rehab and get them to take less heroin today, they're going to want less tomorrow. So that kind of state dependence over time is one key part of how economists have thought about addiction. And I think also how psychologists and medical people have thought about addiction. Um, that by itself doesn't necessarily mean anybody's making a mistake. And so you might have habit formation like that, but still you consumers could be making perfectly rational decisions and not making any mistakes. The other element where, which is more of a kind of behavioral mistake is what we call temptation. So on top of there being this habit formation, the other piece of our definition of addiction is that people in the moment when they make decisions about how much to consume, don't necessarily make the decisions that would maximize their own long-term welfare. In other words, they're gonna tend to consume more in the moment than they would like themselves to uh, if you ask them ahead of time. So imagine asking somebody, you know, if you could choose next week, how much time do you wanna spend watching TikTok videos? Somebody says, like, ah, I don't know. I would probably want to spend 30 minutes a day watching TikTok videos. And if it's the case that when we get to next week, despite the fact that that's what you'd really like to do, you can't help yourself from taking your phone out of your pocket. And instead of watching 30 minutes, you watch 60 minutes or 90 minutes or three hours. That's what we call temptation, which is also something that's been explored a lot in the behavioral economics literature. So the model has those two key pieces. And we say if if somebody has both habit formation and subject to temptation, that's what we're gonna define as the heart of addiction. So the experiment is designed to measure that. As you said, there, there are like two main treatments in the experiment that we randomize. One is called the bonus treatment, which is just we pay people to reduce their social media usage for a few weeks. And the other is called the limit treatment, where we just give people access to um, some kind of screen time like uh, limits that they can set on their own usage. The key thing about those limits, unlike something like screen time on iOS or the analog on Android, is that the, we can make the limits hard so you can't just override them. So you can say, yeah, I want to limit my Facebook usage to 60 minutes a day. And when you hit 60 minutes, we can have it be that, you know, it says, sorry, you've run out of time. And unlike screen time, you can't just override that. So those are the two key treatments, and they're designed to measure this habit formation on the one hand, temptation on the other. So the bonus treatment lets us get at habit formation because think about it like we pay you for three weeks to reduce your usage. So for three weeks, you've pushed down your usage of social media for a kind of random reason uh, because of this bonus we're giving you. Then the question is, after that, after we're no longer paying you anything to reduce your usage, do you continue to use it less? And that would be the sort of signature of habit formation here. If I push down your usage today, does that then cause you to use less in the future when this bonus is no longer in effect? Um, on the temptation side, these limits should have no impact for somebody who's not subject to temptation. 
If there's no temptation, there's no reason that you'd ever want to set limits on yourself because you're always going to make the right decision when tomorrow comes. What what you're going to choose, what your tomorrow self is going to choose is the same thing as what your today self would like your tomorrow self to choose. So you don't really want screen time limits. If you are subject to temptation, on the other hand, that kind of commitment is really valuable because you want your future self to use less and you can tie your future self's hands. So if we see that those limits are used, people actually do want to set limits, and those limits really change people's usage, then that's the kind of signature of temptation. And so in the results, we see both of those things. There's clear evidence of habit formation and also clear evidence of temptation. I see. So I'd love to contrast one of the findings you find in this paper with another of your papers on the subject. So you here you find that on average participants were willing to pay $4.20 for three weeks of access to the time limit functionality. On the other hand, in a study on Facebook deactivation, you find that participants were unwilling to give it up unless paired, paid fairly large amounts of money, even after they had deactivated it for some time. So could these findings mm -hmm. inform us on the best way to design digital self-control tools? And how can we also increase the demand for these tools? Mm, yeah, that's a that's a really neat question. And I think it's I think it it highlights something really important, which is two things are true. One, people want to use social media less. And two, people do not want to give up social media altogether. And I think what that tells us is that the the there's a lot of the minutes that people spend on social media that really are providing them real value. There's a lot of things that you, people use social media for, staying in touch with their friends, advocating for some cause, finding new people to connect with, sharing information, watching funny videos, like lots of those things are really beneficial to people and things that they really value a lot. And in that experiment, the other experiment that you mentioned, not the digital addiction one, but the earlier one where we paid people to basically quit Facebook altogether for a month, it was really clear that a lot of people missed it. Like they really felt like, um, man, there's stuff I'm missing out on. There were people who said, you know, I don't have a lot of friends who live near me. Like the main way that I keep in touch with my friends is on Facebook. And now you know, I, I can't keep in touch with them anymore. That makes me really sad. So in all this discussion, it's really easy to lose track of the fact that there's a huge amount of benefit that people are getting. And as an economist, that's, you know, in some sense, pretty obvious, like, here's a new technology that is so good that people want to spend hours a day using it. Um, it could be that that's all a huge mistake. But like, boy, would it be difficult to get people to spend hours and hours using something which is completely terrible for them. That value is, is I think, big and really important. Um, nevertheless, as the digital addiction paper shows, on the margin, you know, the 200th minute people are spending or the 250th minute that people are spending, there is this tendency to use it too much or to get into some mindless state where you just keep scrolling through you know, more videos and more videos and you don't go for the run that you were going to go for and stuff like that. So those two things are present together. And I think what it says is the way we need to address this is not to try to ban social media or get rid of social media or just kind of blindly reduce how much people use it, but give people tools to shape their usage either that they themselves can shape their usage or possibly to shape the platforms in ways that are going to allow um, more of the of what people themselves value while helping them reduce those extra minutes on the margin. Um, and these kinds of you know time limits, screen time limits are one tool for that um, that we've explored. I don't think that's the only tool and not necessarily the most effective um, but I think there are a number of things that look like that where we can help reduce that overconsumption problem while still letting people get the value that they do get from a lot of the great stuff that's on social media. I see. So you also mentioned earlier that the nature of the commitment devices you used in your study was different from that that's used by either technology companies or social media companies. 
So do you think it's beneficial and even sufficient for social media companies to offer commitment devices or is this somewhere where we might require government intervention? Yeah, that's a, a really interesting question. So um, a few things I would say. One, I think it's interesting that Apple and Google and others offer these kinds of uh, commitment devices and and screen time type technologies at all. Like they don't have to, nobody made them do that. You might have a model of them of they just want people to use their phones as much as possible. And uh, why would they ever, you know, why would Apple ever create something on iPhones that by default tracks your usage and has something pop up every week telling you like, hey, here's how much you used your phone. Congratulations, you reduced your screen time this week let you set limits might seem like kind of a weird thing for them to do. I think the fact that they're doing it reflects something really important, which is that they do have incentives to care not just about immediate short-term usage, but also the long-term utility that people get from these products. Um, and that differs for different companies, depending on their business models. I think Apple in particular, because they're in the business of selling you devices that you then use for a long time, probably have more incentive to care about the, the long run utility of their users. A company like Facebook or TikTok maybe, I think has incentives that are a little more tilted toward the short run, although they may also have some long run incentives. So I do think that um, the, the these companies own incentives are more aligned with helping users solve this problem than we might sometimes imagine. And that can be a, powerful force in favor of it. Now that said, I, you know, their incentives are not perfectly aligned or not all that great. And so there are limits. And I think you see that in the fact that they don't make these screen time te technologies maybe as effective as they could be. So how do we get more of that? I am a little bit skeptical of government regulation as a solution to that particular problem, although I think it could play a role I, I, my biggest worry there is just government regulation, certainly in the US, tends to be very slow, very lumbering kind of process that has lots of um, political considerations that end up driving it. And these technologies are moving really fast, changing really fast. And it's and it's easy to end up with regulations that are just not um, efficient, not effectively suited you know, like U.S. senators are not in general uh, the the most up to date finger on the pulse of the new technologies kind of people around, and so I think we often see regulation in these sectors that ends up being really inefficient just because the world is moving fast and the regulation can't keep up. Um, there may be scope for some of that, but I think another way to do it is increasing the pressure on these companies from consumers, from other groups um, to improve their products in this way. And also, you know, th I think there's there's a role for third party companies in creating these kinds of tools. There are lots of companies that have stepped in and created um, alternative tools that people can use to monitor and moderate their own usage. There are lots of organizations that are involved in digital literacy and education and helping people adopt healthier practices. You don't, there's a lot of stuff you can do that doesn't require any new, any change to the platform, you know, like don't sleep with your phone right next to your bed or put it away for, you know, an hour before you go to sleep and lots of things like that, that I think are actually quite effective. Um, and so that kind of education has a role too. I see. Now, taking a different direction on the modern media discussion, modern media such as social network platforms tend not to go through the fact checking that established newspapers go through. And I read in her book, uh, How to Stand Up to a Dictator, 2021 Nobel Peace Prize winner Maria Ressa argues that US platforms excessively focus on users in rich Western democracies. So how do you think your work could extend to the developing world? Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting question. I mean, I don't think that the phenomenon that 
current US media or current European media focuses overwhelmingly on consumers in rich countries is in any way new. I think that's been true for a very long time. It was true, you know, before social media, it was true before digital media. Um, it was true before television. That's really the nature of, of demand in those countries, which is, um, you know, we might think that it's a bad thing, but the truth is by sort of revealed preference, many people everywhere in the world are most interested in things happening close to them, things happening in their own countries, things happening to people who sort of look like them. You know, that's that's a deep part of human psychology, which is very problematic in, in many ways, but it's also just a kind of reality that we have to work with. And so that's been reflected in the media in the US for a very long time, but also in lots of other places. I lived in India for a year when I was in college. And, you know, if you looked at the newspapers in India, they were overwhelmingly reporting on things happening in India and what was, you know, going on between India and Pakistan and what was happening in cricket and lots of other things like that that were of particular interest there. So I don't think that's anything we're going to change or get away from. I do think that media have a really important role for bringing to people's attention things outside of their nearby sphere. Um, and I, I, I think it's a neat question that I haven't really done research on specifically, how could we get them to um, do more of that? The, the other thing I would say, which is a different answer to that question is many of the pathologies of social media are especially worrying as they pertain to many developing countries. So I think if you just said, let, where do we really see harms from social media that we should be worried about? One of the, the categories of that that I would be most worried about are some of the things we've seen where social media is used to stoke ethnic violence and hate crimes and um, the the like real world violence and harm against different groups and, and that has happened everywhere it's not limited to developing countries but i think that is something that's certainly shown up in a really serious way in a lot of developing countries um and and that's a real concern that i think the platforms need to take more seriously um limiting those harms as they pertain to those countries i think is incredibly important Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Another really topical issue today is the metaverse and where people think the metaverse is going to look and going to go in the future. So what do you think are the implications of a rise in the metaverse? And if it achieves its expectations, further blurring the line between the virtual and the real world, how would this change the kind of issues you explore? Yeah, gosh, I have no idea. I, I'm I'm a little bit of a metaverse skeptic. I think not because I actually know anything about it, but just as a, as a kind of casual observer, I think, um, you know, my guess is like, like many things, um, these predictions imagining what the metaverse might look like are probably right eventually, but they also are going to take a lot longer than people are kind of imagining or some people are imagining right now. So I'm happy to bet that in five or 10 years, we are not going to be all living in the metaverse. Um, I do think it's really interesting. Yeah, like as, as technologies become more immersive, as um, if people do start spending a bunch of time in kind of virtual reality environments, how is that different for things like getting information um, and uh, democracy and so on? Um, I, I, I really have no idea. I think, I think that my guess, if I had to guess is that it's not fundamentally different from the kind of thing that we've seen with social media. If this is just like a lot of decentralized peer to peer social sharing of information, I think that may work fairly similarly, um, to that. Another thing I think is if we want to know what the metaverse looks like, the best place to look for that are, are some of the existing like video game platforms 
where people do, they don't need 3D glasses and, you know, fancy VR headsets, but like people spend a lot of time already in 3D worlds like, you know, Fortnite or World of Warcraft or whatever, where they um, are interacting with lots of other people, communicating with lots of other people, doing social things. Something we see there is just like getting news and information about the world does not rank very highly on the list of what people want to do in those environments so far. Nobody has thought it was a great business model to create like a um, immersive 3D news uh, paper or something. And my guess is that's going to remain true. So most of, for at least a long time, most of the, the metaverse applications that do really take off and draw people in are going to be more things like games, those kinds of experiences, as well as um, ways for people to communicate and socialize and interact with each other. So we still are in a world with rapidly expanding data and technology capabilities. So what are some future data sets and research that you are keen to explore? Um, yeah, I, th there's so much that I would love to explore. I think that, I think there's a real transition happening where, you know, in the last 15, 20 years, we really got our heads wrapped around how to use text as a source of data, which has been really important in this media space. Now people are just starting to grapple with, you know, how do we do quantitative large-scale research involving things like video and images and audio that are becoming um, a bigger and bigger part of things. So that's one question. One exciting source of data is just how do we start making making video content and image audio content, um, something we can study at scale. The second is just all of these AI technologies are also really important um, statistical tools and tools for analyzing data, using data. There's all lots of like deep neural networks and language models, large scale language models are already finding applications in um, research in the media space. You know, if you're trying to process lots of text data from Twitter or somewhere else and kind of map that into something like, is this tweet something that sounds more like a conservative or sounds more like a liberal with those kind of applications, these deep learning models are really effective and I'm excited to see where that goes. Um, a, a third thing is I, so probably like a lot of people, I've recently been playing around with some of these open APIs for, um, some of these recent AI tools like image generation and chat GPT or these chat bots that, um, sit on top of these big language models. And I, I don't know whether you've played with those, but it just, it's kind of mind blowing to me, um, both that kind of image generation capability and then um, with these chat bots. Like I was, the, the paper that we talked about right at the beginning of this about like newspaper slant, you know, what we had done in that paper was use some really simple text analysis methods to try to figure out what are Republican and Democratic phrases, what are phrases that tend to indicate in a particular news article that it's kind of slanted right or slanted left. Um, and I, I just like, was experimenting with typing into chat GPT, like here's some text. Would you say this is more likely to have been said by a Republican or more likely to have said by a Democrat? Or, you know, here's a phrase, undocumented workers, how would a Republican tend to say that? And it was just like unreal how well this thing is able to answer those kinds of questions. So I don't know how we use that those technologies in research, but it feels like um, there's incredible potential there and starting to figure out how we can harness more of that, I find really exciting. But there are probably going to be some smart undergrads and graduate students coming along um, who are going to do really amazing things with those technologies. Well, that brings me to my final question. And it's something we ask every economist on our podcast. What gives you hope? Yeah, it's it's a it's a great hard question right now because I would say it's been a rough few years for the world in a lot of ways. Um, I think that 
the the thing I would focus on, um, let me say two things. So one is a kind of cheap answer, but the real answer is like what I actually do a lot of my life is like, you know, try to raise some kids and have a family and um, looking at them and their learning and things that, uh, you know, potential for lots of my students here at Stanford and lots of others, I think constantly gives me hope. A little bit less cliche than that, I think we tend to focus on news events, changes that are happening in the world and focus overwhelmingly on negative changes. The overall trends and overall thrust of how things in the world have changed in the last 50 years is incredibly positive. The the things like the number of people living in poverty, life expectancy, the number of kids dying from preventable diseases, the uh, standard of living of many people, the number of people dying in wars and conflicts, all of these things have changed over time in incredibly positive directions. And many people in the world today are living lives that are, at least on those kinds of measures, much better than people 50 or, or 100 years ago. And so that big picture trend, I think, is easy to lose sight of and is incredibly important. I'm optimistic that 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 continues and that the broad sweep of things continues to be really positive. I do think that this is a moment where probably more than at any time in my lifetime, that feels at risk. One big part of that has been you know, improving health and things like a major worldwide pandemic are probably the biggest threat to that that I've seen in my lifetime. And similarly, a huge part of that has been in the 20th century, we had major nation states fighting wars against each other and grinding up and killing millions of people. We have not had that at that kind of scale for 75 years. Um, and, and we see more at risk of that these days than at any time, probably in my lifetime. So it's a it's a scary potential inflection point, but I remain really optimistic that we're not gonna flip back that progress, swerve back on those things, and that that kind of broad trend of progress will continue. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us, Professor Gensko. I had a really interesting conversation and it was amazing to learn all of the insights that you've been working on over the years and also about your future plans. Okay, well, thank you so much for inviting me. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. I hope you have a great day. Okay, take care. Bye-bye.